watch this. Today, Idaho lost one of the greats, Dick Fosbury. We take a look back at the man who changed how people jump high, the man who made a flop famous. What's this? Something being discussed at the state house people actually care about? They're talking property taxes, and they're taking a unique approach to it. One is the loneliest number. It's also the inspiration to save a species. Tonight, we're telling the story of Lonesome Larry, the one salmon who helped the sockeye resurge at Redfish Lake. If you were to ask Idahoans for their one wish list item for the Idaho legislature this year to accomplish, something to get done, it's a good chance the answer is property tax. In fact, Boise State did that, and taxes were top five. So we could also queue up 100 texts from you at home about how with the growth of Idaho and how property taxes have handicapped budgets for families around the state and go on and on and on. So, yeah, you asked, lawmakers listen. Today, the day for the big introduction of what looks like the property tax relief bill for the year, or at least what's left of it. Joe Paris joins me now with what this idea looks like. Joe, does it seem to have an idea of what Idahoans want? And can it fix what they're asking for? Yeah, it's interesting because Idahoans are asking for a lot, and this does address a few different things that we'll touch on here. But yes, this final idea, as we'll call it for now, it saw a pitch in committee this morning as the session is winding down. It really is a compromise between a couple of ideas that we've touched on here, but are being discussed at the State House. House Bill 77 and 79 look to angle for a way to create property tax savings. So those two big ideas are now in one piece of legislation. House Bill 292. So two new state funds to talk about in the proposal. First, lawmakers propose taking 4.5% of annual sales tax revenue from the state to create a tax credit for primary residences. And that's a home where a, an owner has their homeowner's exemption at. And this isn't the first time that Idaho has used sales tax revenue to address other taxing concerns, but this is a pretty straightforward end result. Tax money is used to help Idahoans pay their property taxes down. There is a caveat here, though. Lawmakers crafted the bill so property tax relief credits will not go towards school bonds and levies that voters approve on their own. The logic, voters agreed to raise their taxes for a community project. Now, sponsor Senator Scott Rowe explains the rationale and net result that they're looking to accomplish with these tax credits. Every homeowner will receive the same percentage reduction in their property tax. So, for example, if you had a $3,000 property tax, then whatever that tax total of all of the different things added up to, mine would be a specific dollar amount that was directed as relief towards the things that you can't vote on, non-school kinds of things. And so everyone will receive the same percentage, whether you're in a, a wealthy district, a rural district, wherever, you're getting the same percentage, not the same dollars, but the same percentage of relief. And that percentage relief, it really tries to account for the different areas and the, the paces of growth across the state. So the other big part of the bill deals with bonds and levies and sending money to schools. As mentioned in House Bill 79 from House Speaker Mike Moyle, Representative Monks, they're looking to dedicate millions of dollars to send to Idaho schools for the purpose of addressing needs that bonds and levies have had to cover in recent years. Things like building maintenance and construction, expensive tax projects that communities need to do but raise taxes. So the idea here is to send millions of dollars, money, to every Idaho school district for their facilities. It's called the School District Facilities Fund, and districts would be sent money based on their daily average attendance, and the bill outlines that money sent to the districts needs to be used in a specific order. First, payment of their school bond. Second, the payment of their school levies. Third, they can save the money sent to them for future school facility project needs, and four, they can use for new bonds. Now, the concept here, avoid running new bonds and levies so communities don't have to vote to raise their property tax. There's a caveat to here as well, though. The bill eliminates the March election date that school districts use for bonds and levies. Now, Quinn Perry with the Idaho School Boards Association expressed concerns in committee that the portion of the bill losing that election, it could really impact schools. Democrat Representative Laura Nekachea echoed those ideas as well. This date is used by an overwhelming majority of school districts, especially those who rely on supplemental levies to maintain the operations of their public schools. As you can imagine, predictability and stability are two key factors in operating Idaho's public school systems, and we believe that removing this date is, is removing the one that provides the most in predictability and stability. These 
levy elections are a conversation with voters. So if they can keep the March levy and it doesn't pass, then they can say, okay, voters didn't support us at this level. Let's see if they support us at this level and then try again in May. And just it gives us more, op they give the schools more options to do everything they can to retain the teachers and other staff that our kids need so that they can learn in school. One of the many co-sponsors of the idea, Representative Jason Monks, he addressed those concerns we just heard in committee, and he says getting rid of the March election is based on timing of budgeting committees in Idaho and the requests that are sent to them. You have to have that information in 50 days prior to that, which so we're talking the end of January. They have to already submit the language that they want for that bond or levy. As you guys are well aware, we are barely starting hearings within JFAC and they have not yet set their budgets on how much the schools will receive for bonds and levies. And so I felt that it was, um, in, didn't, didn't seem appropriate that they'd be asking for additional money from the taxpayers when they don't even know what their base salary, I guess, if you wanna use that as an example, what their base salary is gonna be. So anytime you talk about property tax or all kinds of taxing ideas, the question is who's left holding the bag here? Well, the bill sponsors are adamant that this is an idea that's set up to really work and it's not a tax shift, so to speak. So the idea is nobody's on the hook here for an issue. Funding for the entire idea, both piles of money come from tax credits and it really comes from a variety of other ideas as well as sales tax, tax rebate, surplus eliminator, general fund dollars, the internet sales tax coffers, just to name some of the funding mechanisms for both the funds that I just touched on. Brian, the program also recalibrates a circuit, circuit breaker, and that's a program that helps disabled and elderly Idahoans with their property taxes. Some eligibility for that was expanded in the pitch as well, so the idea did pass the full house committee and now heads to the full house. Okay, I know, Joe, you want to clear out a room at a party, you start talking about property taxes. The bottom line is, is this going to do anything to help people who've been asking for that? I, it, it should. If this does pass the full house, you would have two things happening. Those tax credits would be immediate relief on the property taxes and that second bucket, making sure that your local school district doesn't have to have bonds and levies, then they don't have to raise your property taxes. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Again, we'll keep an eye on those as they make it through. Two other bills we've been following well, now no longer need to be. The attempt to limit absentee ballots in Idaho. The only to only those in the military, those who are disabled or hospitalized, or if you're out of the area for work or school, they did not. That one did not make it out of the House today. House Bill 205 failed 40 to 30, but that doesn't mean there isn't another absentee ballot bill out there we could see before the end of the session. And remember the other one, the attempt to alter Idaho's constitution and repeal our Blaine Amendment. That amendment prevents public funds being used to support religious organizations, including schools. It was one of the things that many felt stood in the way of education savings accounts, even though the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled such amendments, which many states have, I believe 37 out of 50, well, it can be circumvented. Anyway, Idaho's Blaine will remain because after that first resolution was introduced in the Senate Education Committee last month, it's gone nowhere. Another one was brought forward last week in the House State Affairs Committee, but today the sponsor, Republican Representative Elaine Price from Coeur d'Alene, she was told there really is enough time to talk about it, so her bill will not get a hearing this session. So like an Irish goodbye, it will leave quietly and without much attention. Well, today marks Monday, it's, yeah, it's the 13th, March 13th, marks three years since COVID-19 was first detected in Idaho, the deadly disease that took more than 5,400 Idahoans. The pandemic left us confused and scared from the beginning. Today, though, we're past the mask mandates well past the online learning and way past wiping down our groceries when we return home. We live in a world now where there's a COVID vaccine. With over 976,000 Idahoans fully vaccinated as of today, also as of today, a bill was introduced to make administering an mRNA vaccine, like the COVID vaccine, a misdemeanor. Let's back up, though. On Friday, a viewer asked us a question about House Bill 154, which is along the lines, do you know where the vaccine law stands with this House Bill 154 at this moment? This is incredibly important to me and my family. I'm sure we aren't alone. 976,000 other Idahoans might want to know. House Bill 154, called Vaccines Misdemeanor, adds a new section to cha Chapter 9, Title 18 of Idaho Code, which means that providing or administering that mRNA vaccine in a person or a mammal in Idaho, that would be a misdemeanor. The original bill was sent back to get rewritten to take out the other mammal part because, well, cattle farmers use it to, in, or in, in, to vaccinate their cattle, right? They say they use mRNA vaccines to keep their cattle safe. Currently, there is a new version of this bill, though. House Bill 307, again, reintroduced today or introduced today. And as you can see, they're pretty much identical 
except they took out or other mammal from the bill. So the cows are protected. Today, House Bill 307 was introduced, referred to committee for printing, and we will keep you updated if this goes further. Oh, as far as COVID is concerned, as of March 4th, last week, this year, we had a 13.7 positivity rate across Idaho. As of last week, 3,797 PCR tests. So not a lot of tests compared to the height of the pandemic, but we're still looking at some low numbers because, well, some of these aren't being reported. So we're not seeing all the right numbers when it comes to what's being turned in for COVID. This time last year, on 20, uh, March 12th, 2022, statewide positivity rate was only at 3.8%. So we're getting worse, but they had 19,967 PCR tests performed this time last year. Idaho is one of the lowest, like in the bottom five of equal pay amounts. And whether she's your doctor cutting your hair, representing you in court, if it's a woman, well, she's probably making less than a man, especially in Idaho. Today, women gathered at the state house to rally for equal pay. Tomorrow, by the way, is both Idaho Women's Day and Equal Pay Day. Equal Pay Day represents how far into the year women would have to work to earn the same amount men have earned the year before, up to this point. And Idaho isn't doing too well on the wage gap. According to the U.S. Census, American communities surveyed in 2019, the average median income for men in Idaho was about $49,000. For women, $12,000 less, sitting around $37,000. 2021, women earned about 75 cents per dollar the men earned. According to the National Women's Law Center, Idaho ranked 45th for gender pay equity in 2021. Top five for worst states for gender pay equity. No wonder the Southwest Idaho Now chapter held a call today to action to try to close that wage gap. Three things they want to say. One of them is making sure that we have paid leave for family and medical issues. Um, and also then on the wage specifically, we are looking at making sure that, that people know what the range is when they apply for a job, that that is available to them either when they're interviewing or before when it's actually advertised. And also that companies are not allowed to discriminate and retaliate against people and employees who talk to other employees about what they earn. So how do you get those three things? Well, they say they want the legislature to redo Idaho's Equal Pay Act, which was last done in 1969. You know, there are a few phrases that are certainly overused in sports. One game at a time, greatest of all time, change the game. Well, there aren't too many who can lay claim to that last one, but Dick Fosbury did that, literally. Before the 1968 Olympics, the high jump was performed the world over by just running at the bar, straight at it, and just jumping over it, facing forward, leg first. Then Dick Fosbury came along and showed everyone another way. The Foz passed away in his sleep early Sunday morning at the age of 76, just a week after his 76th birthday. He's been battling cancer and had a recent recurrence, we're told. 
Seven years ago, Mark Johnson spent some time with the Olympic champion just before the games in Rio. And today, we revisit that visit to honor Dick Fosbury in our 208 redial. <laughs> It would take a few years for the Fosbury flop to catch on from its humble beginnings in the mid 60s at Medford High. But when Dick Fosbury started flying higher than anyone else, the world started to notice. 1968 was a was a breakthrough uh, where I went from, you know, the top 50 in the United States to number one in the world. Seven feet, four inches. That was the height he needed to clear in Mexico City to win the gold medal. It wasn't a world record, but it was an Olympic and national record, and it was pure gold. I didn't know how I did it, I just knew I got there. And then landing in the pit, and coming out celebrating, and the stadium was, was going uh, crazy. A life-changing moment for a man who would become the sports ambassador, and still is. These days, Dick Fosbury spends his time helping develop young talent at high jump camps around the country. Run and jump, and then hit your landing. And he spends as much time as he can around his neighboring track team at Wood River High. His legendary status in the sport not lost on the young men and women 50 years his junior. When you're doing the Fosbury flop and then all of a sudden Dick Fosbury flies into the track, you're going, is this the guy? <laughs> so I think most of them kind of figure that out. I love working with kids and we've got the Simplot Games track camp. So, you know, it's great for the state of Idaho. Fosbury is in the U.S. Olympic, U.S. National Track and Field and World Sports Humanitarian Halls, Halls of Fame. He has worked for 25 years. He did work for 25 years as city engineer in Ketchum and was twice elected as a Blaine County Commissioner most recently in 2020. The Idaho Democratic Party, which Fosbury was a member, said, quote, the legacy of Dick Fosbury extends far beyond the high jump. A longtime civil rights advocate and business leader, he was a pillar of the Wood River Valley. He exemplified so many of our values, fairness, grit, and innovative action. On behalf of the Idaho Democratic Party, I would like to extend my deep sympathies and condolences to the family and loved ones of Commissioner Fosbury.
I want my daughter, who's six and a half years old, to be able to come up and see the salmon run. That is her right as an American. It's her right as a human being. And you may be wondering why we are showing an old interview of first-time Academy Award winner Jamie Lee Curtis, who just last night won the Supporting Actress Oscar for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Well, that interview was from nearly 20 years ago, the summer of 1993, when Jamie Lee was living in nearby Sun Valley and stopped by Redfish Lake to be part of the much-publicized release of Sockeye Salmon. So what made this release so unusual? Well, the year before, the Snake River Sockeye Salmon Run, which apparently every American must see, according to Jamie Lee Curtis, the numbers of fish returning to Redfish Lake to spawn could be counted on one finger, hot dog finger or otherwise. So that's our three degrees of separation to tell this story. Academy Awards, Redfish Lake, Lonesome Larry who spawned several generations since, and some say is singularly responsible for saving Idaho's sockeye salmon. We raise fish, breed fish. From small fries to yearling smolts, millions of sockeye salmon start their lives here at the Eagle Fish Hatchery. We run a nursery and we kind of replace the, the natural production that used to happen in, in Redfish Lake. The fish hatchery functions with a focus on the future, but it also has a storied history. Well, one story in particular connects it to Redfish Lake. You know, Redfish got its name because there were thousands of fish that came back. That was generations ago, when tens of thousands of sockeye would make the 900-mile journey back to spawn from the Pacific, the most arduous swim for North American sockeye. The highest in elevation, furthest south, furthest inland, Redfish got its name because of all the redfish that were, you know, in there. So many salmon, the story goes, you could walk across the water on their backs. But then came the dams, and after decades of declining return numbers, Idaho's Snake River sockeye salmon was put on the endangered species list for the first time in 1991. Then a year later, in late summer, just one fish returned to redfish. You're just one fish. They called him Lonesome Larry. This first arrival is a treasured sight. As a representative of a species that's almost gone, it, it's, it's very special. We're glad to see him back and hopefully some others that have started to trip will also make it. Well, they didn't. It was a shock, but I mean, it was a shock we saw coming. And that shock sparked a movement, which began when Lonesome Larry was moved to the Eagle Fish Hatchery. A broodstock savior program was hatched, where Larry's sperm was used to fertilize new generations of sockeye. And yeah, and he was the catalyst that certainly brought an awful lot of attention um, to the plight of, of Redfish Lake sockeye. Which is why, even before the fruits of Lonesome Larry's labor could be felt, in August of 1993, dozens of people, including Jamie Lee Curtis, this is Cecil, make, ladies and make, gentlemen. Make, make, they themselves returned to Redfish to watch yeah. and help release the eight sockeye released today represent the future of the run. <laughs> and to begin restoring the species. Dwindling numbers. And it's worked. Since then, Snake River sockeye salmon have rebounded. 2022 was, was our largest return since 2014, and we got just under 800 adults back. And thanks to what's happening at the Eagle Hatchery, many share the same genetic code as Lonesome Larry. We put I think it was close to a thousand fish in Redfish Lake last year. All inspired by one Lonesome Larry. Yes. Lonesome Larry, a legendary story, sure, but also a cautionary tale. What if you guys did nothing? There probably wouldn't be a Redfish Lake stock. I doubt there would be any uh, sockeye in Redfish. Okay, I got to make a correction. I said 20 years ago. I know it's 30 years ago, but Jamie Lee Curtis just looks so good. It couldn't have been 30 years, right? Couldn't have been. Also, Lonesome Larry got his name because Phil Counts, the Kuntz, I should say, that you just saw in that old piece from 1992, his daughter named Lonesome Larry, Lonesome Larry. That'd be Allison. The fish that saved a species, kind of like the fish that saved Pittsburgh without the basketball and disco and Dr. J. You know, Larry wasn't the only salmon removed from Redfish Lake in 1992 to jumpstart the breeding process. There were about a dozen or so taken to the Eagle Fish Hatchery in the early 90s. And they still have several milk samples cryogenically frozen should something catastrophic happen to the species. It wasn't an overnight success, though. Through the rest of the 90s, fewer than 10 sockeye made it back to Idaho each year. It did peak in 2014 with more than 1,500, but a heat wave wiped them out, wiped out that progress in 2015. 
We averaged fewer than 200 returns each year since, which is why the sockeye salmon are still under protected status on the Snake River. They did, that 800 that did return last year, it pales in comparison with the 4,500 in 1956 before most of the eight dams along the Columbia and Snake Rivers we put in front of them. All right, let's get right to your comments. Kathy wants to know or says there's no way women will get equal pay in Idaho. They can't even make medical decisions for their own body. Idaho is considered the worst state in the U.S. for women's rights. If this mRNA bill passes, I'll have to go to Oregon to get my COVID booster. OK, chalk up another trip out of state for health care, says Rob. So we can have a safe have safe cattle, but human mammals are dead meat in the case of an epidemic. Great question. Irish goodbye. Never heard of it. 